um, last time we looked at the, the theory uh, for E1 uh, with n flavors. This is the quiver. We computed that the six branch is the minimal nilpotent orbit of the SLN. And uh, it's the set of n, n by n matrices such that trace of m is zero, m squared is zero, and um, rank of m is at most one. Okay, and uh, we started computing the color branch. And um, we will, uh, so let me just uh, specify the answer is the uh, client singularity type A. And uh, we, uh, we gave some indications for computing uh, the, the modular space. We said that there are uh, uh, operators VM M is a magnetic charge. Uh, the, the Coulomb branch is the space of the rest monopole operators. X is electric. And the Coulomb branch is magnetic. So I need to use magnetic objects. So uh, these are the magnetic charges that the UM theory can admit. And uh, we have also the scalar in the vector multiplet, complex valued uh, scalar, which can have any uh, power. This is a dressing factor. Uh, dressing operator. So if I take the uh, operator Vm and phi to the k, regardless of the power of k, the charge of the operator V will be, and that's the reason we call it the dressing factor, um, the um, or the dressing operator, the, the space of all possible uh, operators in the theory is uh, going to divide into infinitely many sectors. Uh, parameterized by the uh, by the magnetic charges. So in this particular case for U1, there is a single magnetic charge and uh, uh, the magnetic charge can take values, uh, which is any integer number. So infinitely many uh, sectors. And within those sectors, there are infinitely many uh, operators uh, which are parameterized by the dressing factor. Dressing factor. Any questions? So uh, we can now uh, write down the, the Hilbert series for the um, modular space. It's going to be a function of two fugacities. The uh, fugacity Z is going to uh, count the magnetic charge. So um, it's going to be a sum over all magnetic charges, charges, which for this case is uh, the set of all integers. And we are going to have the um, 
arc charge of the monopole operator Vn that we'll have to specify what is delta. And uh, we are going to have uh, P M of T, uh, which accounts for the dosing factors and uh, the parameter Z, which is the fugacity of the magnetic charge. Okay, so we're going to perform this sum. Uh, any question? So, um, Delta is the uh, scaling dimension of the monopole operator Vm, and it's um, it has a simple expression. It's going to be proportional to the uh, magnetic charge, but it doesn't care about the sign. And uh, because I have n flavors, it's going to be proportional to the number of flavors. And so it's this uh, value. And there will be some uh, general uh, generalized formulas for uh, cases where I have non abelian gauge loops or a product of gauge loops. So, uh, so let's now uh, evaluate this uh, expression. So it's a sum m in z uh, t to the two uh, n m. And I still didn't say what is m, t, m of t. Uh, it turns out to be independent of um, the magnetic charge, but it's only for the U1 case. It's just one over one minus t squared. Uh, so it's just a generating function for all powers of uh, phi. Uh, if phi has a fugacity, uh, has an R charge uh, t squared, then uh, phi to the k will have t to the 2k, and if I sum over all of them, I get this expression. So I'll have uh, this expression, and since there is no dependence on m, uh, it's going to come out of the sum. And I'll have a z to the m. And let, let, this is an easy sum to perform. It's just a single sum. There is an absolute value, so you need to take care of that. And the final uh, result is 1 minus t to the n, uh, 2n uh, divided by 1 minus t squared, 1 minus t to the n times z, and 1 minus t to the n. Over Z. Any questions? What does it look like? So, uh, so this this expression of the Hilbert series uh, tells me that uh, the uh, the modular space has three generators. at uh, quantum numbers uh, t squared, t to the n times uh, z, and t to the n uh, divided by z. And so now let's evaluate uh, v1 is going to have a delta, which is equal to n, and that's also for v minus one. <laughs> um, I forgot the a factor of one half over here. The minimal contribution is one half. One half. So this is going to be n over two. And um, Uh, 
in phi has a dimension a two. The dimension is one, I'm sorry. And so uh, if we uh, account for the, um, uh, the uh, and, and in addition, the, the charge here is plus one, minus one, and zero, right? The magnetic charge for phi is zero, the magnetic charge for V1 is plus one, and for B minus one is minus one. So those are the three uh, objects that uh, we see over here. There is a factor two difference between the dimension and the power of T. Okay. So uh, since since you're working on a lattice, um, right, the T is the fugacity for uh, C two C two R, and um, for for the uh, for the highest weight. Okay, and uh, the highest weight for SU two R is uh, given uh, by an integer number n. Right. So that's that's the highest weight. N can be zero, one, uh, any non-negative integer number, and uh, the um, the dimension here. Is uh, given by uh, one half factor compared to that. So delta is uh, half. Yeah. So delta is uh, the spin under SU2R, and uh, N is the highest weight under SU2R. Oh. Okay, so since we are dealing with the lattice, we prefer to use integer numbers. So when you think about lattices, it's better to work with these things. Otherwise, if you work with uh, spins, you'll get uh, square roots in the expressions, and that's uh, not convenient for uh, computations. Definitely, if you put it into Mathematica, I don't know what happens for the uh, stage, but in the original expression of the magnetic momentum formula, you write two to the two delta, and then somehow the two is cancelled by the one half inside delta. So it, why don't you just remove both two and one half? What is uh, because uh, they have physical meaning. Yeah, physical. This is the scaling dimension. Scaling dimension. The operator monopole operator and the scaling dimension is related to the highest weight by a factor of two because it's a BPS operator. In And so uh, we we find that those are the three generators of the modular space v plus uh, v minus and phi, and they satisfying a relation. So this has a scaling uh, highest weight n, so it transform in the spin n over two under SU two R. So I should I should think about uh, n plus one different operators, but only one of them is holomorphic. All the others are non-holomorphic. Remember that SU2 R acts in a non-holomorphic way. Uh, same thing for B minus and phi, which has a scaling dimension one. Okay. 
uh, well, in this part, in this, so I, I'll, I'll just, so this is highest weight, highest weight, highest weight. Phi is in the joint representation under SU2. Now, um, the charges, there is a U1 charge. That's the topological charge that I mentioned the other day. It will be a plus one, minus one, and zero. Right. So this is the charge, which is which has a fugacity measured by Z. So those are the two uh, things. Now the relation uh, has a scaling uh, to n. There's one relation which scales like 2n and has zero charge. There is no power of z over here. And so we will write that v plus, v minus, these have scaling dimension. Uh, the, the, and this is n, this is n, so together it's 2n uh, equals phi to the n that also scales like 2n. And this is the equation uh, for the variety. We find that this is uh, C2 mod Z. Any questions? Okay, so um, next I will write the formula. So uh, the, the uh, monopole formula. Well, let me make some uh, further comments. Um, for n equals to two. Uh, something uh, important happens. You see? So there's a question in the audience. Uh, do monopole operators also carry flavor charts? Uh, yes, they can, yeah. They certainly can, but not in this case. Uh, wait, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, I take it back. The, in, in this case, yes, that's this, this is the flavor chart. The topological one. It is a flavor one of the isometry. It's the isometry of C2 mod ZN. So the other one is SG2? It's an SG2 R. And U1. But what happens for when equals to 2? There's a symmetry enhancement. Very good. There is a symmetry enhancement because remember, we said the other day that at uh, weight two and the rest two R, we have the uh, generators of the symmetry in the joint representation. So now instead of one of them, I have three. So uh, the flavor symmetry. is uh, enhanced to SU2. So the, the Yong Zhao is asking, he is referring to the UN in the city of Kuma. That, that is This one? Yeah. yeah. This, uh, it's a, an SUN, not a UN. It's an SUN flavor symmetry, which acts on the Higgs part. Indeed, we saw the other time that, that there is a natural action on the on the Higgs punch and, the, and those guys transform in the joint representation of this flavor symmetry on the Higgs punch. But not at the monopole operator here and not <laughs> So now we can uh, state, remind the point about symplectic duality. There are mass parameters that I can turn on. Those will transform in the agent representation of this flavor symmetry. Right, so the formation parameters, flavor symmetry of the other part. 
here you're referring and so n equals when n is equal to q do you want topology to the symmetry becomes an SUG. Is it Hans? Yes. So it's SUG and SUG R. Yeah, I mean C2 mod Z2 indeed has a enhanced symmetry. Yeah, the SU2 or the, the fact that we have SU2 R but the new one R not uh, uh, shown in the liberty, is it? Oh, in terms of C. SC2R, uh, so the, the Hilbert series takes the parameter T, and this is the, it's what I said here. It's the fugacity for highest weight of SC2R. But I mean, it could, it could be also in one eye, but the animal is going, the T does not escape. The critical difference is the um, uh, symplectic form, right? There is a, the modular spaces that we use are symplectic and holomorphic. That's the, right? So um, being symplectic and holomorphic would uh, require, uh, in, in mathematics, it's called the C-star action. But uh, for the physical uh, use, this C-star action is the highest weight of the uh, SU2R. I mean, you could make it more general. The C-star can act also on functions which are not holomorphic. And then instead of being the highest weight for SC2R, it will be just a weight in the SC2R presentation. But this sister action is just the confluence of algebra of SC2R. Yeah, what what I just wanted to do, uh, I am not making a big point out of it, but the T doesn't just looking at the period of the Hilbert series that one can now make it a thing which we can. Well, there is a critical difference, uh, in particular the this thing here, right? The, at p square, you see you have the symmetry of the modular space, and this is not correct for the new one now. Okay. We continue. Okay, so the global symmetry is. Um, um, a U1 for N greater than two. Uh, for N equals to one, uh, what we get, um, the, the moduli space is, uh, <laughs> It's just H, right? So N equals to one, uh, you will find what we wrote the other time. These two cancel and we get the, the Hilbert series for C2. And um, um, the, and then there is again a symmetry enhancement. Uh, the, uh, the symmetry is SC2 times SC2R, that's what we said the other time. Okay, so those are the uh, different cases for N greater than two. There's the symmetry. Is uh, U1. Okay. Now we could write down the uh, character expansion. Let me uh, do the character expansion here. Uh, for n equals to one, uh, h of t and z will be a sum from a K zero to infinity, K T to the K, as you could uh, easily compute. And so um, we can write the, uh, this as um, 
we, we interpret this to say that at uh, our charge k, uh, so the highest weight of S two R is k, or spin k over two. There is a, a collection of uh, operators which transform in the uh, representation of SU2 global of highest weight K. Right? So there's a correlation between the R charge and the uh, weights of the representation for n equals to two. Uh, I will write the sum zero to infinity is just an OB fold. So it will uh, impose that the powers are even, these factors are even. There's a question in the audience. Yeah. Uh, how about n equals to zero? Uh, for, for n equals to zero, uh, the um, monopole formula is going to uh, fail. Um, it will not make sense over here. Uh, this is a case where uh, we no longer have a symplectic singularity, and the um, uh, we, we, you will have to use a different technique. But there's no way to find out. But here, right? Uh, yeah, there is a um, the uh, from here I could write down the highest weight generating function, which is one over one minus mu t, and for here it would be 1 over 1 minus mu uh, squared t squared, where mu is the fugacity for a highest weight under the global symmetry. So the uh, so the multiple formula is uh, valid only for cases where we deal with the uh, uh, symplectic singularity. There are many cases where the Coulomb branch is not a symplectic singularity, and then the multiple formula does not work. Okay. Any questions about what I wrote over here? What's the question? I said yes. They, they know about the height of the general. Very good. So this is obvious, right? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so let's generalize the monopole formula for any uh, gauge group. So the input is a gauge group G with a representation R. Okay, that's what I need. So I need to specify what is the gauge group. It could be a product. And I need to specify what is the representation. It could be a collection of many representations. And uh, so now I need some uh, uh, objects for those uh, gauge groups. So, um, and this is, uh, has a connection you mentioned before, Langland's uh, duality. So it's very uh, deeply connected with Langland. Uh, there is a weight lattice. So this is the lattice of all possible electric charges that the gauge group can agree. There is a, a dual weight lattice. In physics, uh, you would find the name dual but in mathematics, uh, these are called co-weights. And here we need to be uh, 
to understand what's going on. So uh, whenever I have a weight lattice, there is a natural a bilinear form. These are the weights, so they form a vector space, and these are the co-weights. Weights, co-weights. This is the dual vector space. So uh, in physics, uh, people are completely messing up the notion of weights and co-weights. They, they don't understand them. They call roots, weights, co-weights. But in uh, mathematics, it's very important. It's the distinction between a vector space and a dual vector space. It's like uh, when quantum mechanics, you replace a bra by a case. It's just living in two different uh, uh, worlds. And so I can uh, expand a weight as a linear combination of fundamental weights, and I can expand a co-weight as a linear combination of fundamental co-weights. So we really need to make the distinction between weights and co-weights. We will, uh, since the monopole formula uh, involves magnetic objects, we will need the dual weight line. Um, there is a file loop which uh, acts on uh, both. And uh, let me write, uh, we will need some more, uh, yeah, we will need some more stuff, so I will need, we need some space here. And now, uh, let me write down the uh, Hilbert series, and it will be a function of fugacities. Uh, for possible uh, topological charges. Sum over all co weights denoted by M. They, they are denoted by M because they stand for magnetic charges. All co weights in the dual lattice, lambda hat, but I take the principal of Weil chamber. I need to divide by the Weil group, and I take all of the magnetic charges in the principal of Weil chamber. Now I repeat what I wrote here for the case of U1, P to the two delta. And delta is a function of M. We'll have to specify how delta depends on uh, the choice of the representation. And, uh, and now we will have a ZI to the ji of m, so those are the uh, the currents as functions of m, and the dressing factors, pm, t, and here now I'll write hm, this is the um, subgroup of g, let, let me write it as a very subgroup. that commutes with the, the magnetic charge A. That's HM. And for the DM, I, we set to come with the variance of degrees of HM. PM of T, so PM of T is a product over I, um, one over one minus T to the two DIM, 
How did I label it like that? I am. <clears throat> And now um, I need to use the, this bilinear form. Um, so this bilinear form, I have to put the co-weight here. So the co-weight is um, the typical co-weight will be M and the weights are in a representation. So um, I'll have two, Delta of M equals a sum uh, over the uh, weights in a representation. Uh, so maybe um, the, the set of all weights, that it's not the representation itself. So uh, I should uh, give a name for the weight space. Uh, what's the common? Um, weight space for the representation R. Uh, I have to come up with the name, so WR. Weights of representation. Oh. Okay, so I, I sum over all such weights and I take this bilinear form. <coughs> over here, I put the co weight, which is M, and over here, I take the weight. Okay. Minus a sum over roots and the delta a delta is the set of the roots and again. I take M, alpha, and close. Okay. This is a contribution from the gate sector because it goes over the roots, the adjoint representation. This is the contribution from the matter sector, from the representation that we pick. And like uh, we know in um, better function computations of four dimensional theories, the gate sector comes with a negative sign, and the uh, metal sector comes with a positive sign. Uh, the detection in the audience, WR are called dominant weights? No, just weights, all possible weights. All possible weights. So if, if I have a, a representation, I need to go over all weights of this representation. Can we, can we go through an explicit example? What do you think? <laughs> so uh, now the P, P is a nice uh, exercise. Uh, I, so in order to compute this, uh, I, I need to, uh, this is a, an old problem. Suppose that I want to, uh, Compute the algebra which is generated by uh, the adjoint representation, all invariants generated by the adjoint representation. So uh, I'll take uh, the um, how measure of the gauge group and I the PE of the adjoint times T and uh, that's a straightforward exercise. Did you do this exercise? 
it gives you precisely this. Mm -hmm. um, for any. For any, yeah. So this is this is the uh, computation for any group. So in more general situations, you would replace this expression by um, whatever matter you are left with. It doesn't have to be the joint representation. But since we are dealing with the a theory with eight supercharges, all we have for the development factor are in the adjoint representation. Okay, any questions? So I, I think I'm done with the, ah, we, we need to say what is J? J I of M are uh, the, uh, so they are given in terms of the masses, the, the magnetic charges. Uh, are we uh, conserved charges of the uh, uh, this uh, moduli space? And there is a uh, one per u one factor. In uh, G. So if G contains a collection of U1 factors, for each one of them, I will have its own uh, conserved chart, it's a topological chart, and I will have to uh, explicitly uh, express a J as a function of M. Okay, I'll, I'm going to erase this part here. Any questions? Okay, so let's let's now uh, take a simple quiver, K and N, like that, and attempt to compute. But before that, uh, let me give an exercise. Before I, uh, we forget about the one n case, let me give an exercise. Uh, let me give the exercise here. I forgot about this exercise. It's a good exercise. Turn on background. Magnetic charges for a U one to the with n labels and compare to the whole little wood polynomial. Of uh, partition uh, n minus one one and also of partition two one to the n minus two. So we will soon see that. Okay, so this quiver K and N, uh, let's we just follow the prescription that uh, we have here. First of all, we need to identify the, the lattice of co weights. So uh, the gauge group is the uh, UK. Uh, it has a set of electric charges, E1 up to EK. And uh, correspondingly, magnetic charges, one per each uh, U1. So uh, I will denote them by M1 up to MK. K charges. And each one of them is an integer number. Okay.
So this is the, uh, so the, the dual lattice. Lambda hat. The first thing we said over here, it's the co-weight lattice. Set of magnetic charges. Now the vial loop is a, a scale. The permutation group in K elements. And uh, if I want to divide by the vial group, I'll uh, put an order. So we will put an order for uh, lambda divided by W. Uh, the parameters will be M1 greater than M2, greater than M3, greater than M3. I just put an order, you could put either less than or greater than, it's not yeah, as, as it's forbidden. Okay, so now we identified what to sum, right? This is the sum. Delta. Uh, delta is a function of M, and it's uh, going to have a contribution of one half per hypermultiplet. So it's a repetition of the formula that we had uh, somewhere here. This one. So the one half per hyper, I have n hypers, and I have the magnetic charges. So the sum over i from one to k, m i. Okay. Now I could also introduce uh, background charges. This is a place to introduce background charges. Background charges to introduce. Uh, we will give the flavor group here a set of charges. Let's call them primes. M1 prime, M2 prime, all the way up to Mn prime. Okay. And then delta of M will be corrected. And now it's function of n prime as well. Um, one half. And, and um, I, I no longer need the n. So this n will turn into a sum. I from one to k and another sum j from one to n. Then I will have M I minus M prime. Okay, so if I set all of those charges to zero, I should recover the problem. So it's easier to compute the Hilbert series when all background charges are zero. If I set those background charges to be non-zero, I should expect expression which are uh, um, related to the polynomial polynomial of the corresponding partition. Any questions? Well, just uh, uh, like physical, well, I don't know, I don't have an intuition to background magnetic charges. So I think we have as many magnetic and background magnetic charges and uh, yeah, so you, you you did some computations in the past. Where you look for the uh, background uh, baryonic charges. Ah, so it's like they are dual to each other. Ah, okay. So they, in the Higgs branch, they are like baryonic. That's right. So the Higgs branch could have, if, if I ask um, for the Higgs branch to count uh, operators with a fixed baryonic charge, not zero, but something different than zero. Then I will have to turn on background failure proof terms, background baryonic charges, and uh, compute the formula. It would be more complicated expression, 
but it's a doable expression. And here, the, it's the precise analog of that. The, those baryons are related to the formations of the Higgs punch, and uh, magnet, background magnetic inductors are related to the formation of the cooler punch. But I don't think it's a choice. I don't have to. Okay. It's up to you. It's it's up to what it, it's what what the, what you want the Hilbert series to uh, uh, express. It's like yeah. uh, when I choose between the learning model life days that I want to want to give to the master. Yeah, it's it's the up to the physical problem you are interested in computing. Both of them are physical quantities. You just need to decide. Uh, what are you after? Like which which physical quantity you're after? And uh, to to relate to the question which we had yesterday about uh, uh, whole little root polynomials, uh, this becomes very relevant when you try to um, perform the sums. So uh, when you have many sums, you need to decide in which order to sum. And uh, when you decide in which order to sum, you have to leave the other parameters free. Those will become background charges. Uh, we will see explicit examples. So where, where is the expression? Um, We have the expression for the sum. We have the expression for delta. Uh, let's uh, let's get this one. So there is only one u1 factor in the gauge loop. The gauge loop is uk. There's a u1 factor, and uh, I will uh, need to compute the, the current associated to that. And this is just simply sum i from one to k m i. And it's the a trace of the uh, co-weight. That's the diagonal uh, subgroup with this rise to this sum. Uh, okay. And there's only one Z, right? So this label here is uh, not necessary because we only have one U1. If there would be Several new ones, I will have to write a J and a Z for each one. Now, PM, now I, I need to uh, figure out what, what's uh, going on. So, uh, given a partition. Lambda or K okay. <laughs> uh, I can have that and uh, let's call it uh, um, sum K I equals to K like that. And then it will tell me that uh, K one M's are equal. But different than the next ones are equal, but different. And so on. So uh, depending on the number of parts, I will have different values of M, which are equal in this particular order. You see that here, when I write the order, I allow for equality. And I need to uh, take a special care for the pieces that they are equal. Then the gauge loop G, which is UK in this particular case, is broken to a product over I, 
UKI. So that's the Levy subgroup for a given partition. I have to take into account all possible partitions. So this also gives you a difficulty in the computation. So the higher the K, I have more partitions to consider. And then um, uh, more uh, computation time. Uh, this is what is called here HM. Okay. That's the Levy subgroup of G, which commutes with M. It's the remaining group after breaking. Yes, so if all M's are uh, different, the group is both yeah. to the maximal uh, group, so it's U1 to the K. If uh, two of them are equal, then it's U2 times U1 to the K minus two. If three of them are equal, then it's U3 and so on. So that M in the delta. Uh, no, in, so HM, yeah. from HM I compute D, uh -huh. and it enters P. Okay. And, uh, and, and we are done. We are done because we explained all of those cases here. So, yes? So, we so are summing over all the MIs for that. And MI is said to be all as you want to approach it as a file group to the Okay. But some of the MIs can be the uh, same value. If two of them are the same values at the gate, we can go to one times minus two, I guess. Well, if what? Uh, if two of the magnetic charges are equal, then you could rotate them to you two. It breaks. You can go to four of the gate. Okay, let, let's uh, take an example uh, of two. So to do the general case will take a, a long time because I will have to right. do all possible cases of partitions. So let's just do uh, K equals to two. Um, okay, K equals to two, and the queen berry is uh, two and ten, like that. So I'll have two magnetic charges, M1 and M2, like here. But I want to impose the uh, Vile group, vile group is uh, S2, and so M1 is bigger equal to M2, and I will have a sum, M1 uh, bigger equal to M2, um, P to the two delta, so delta is over here, uh, N M1 plus N M2, uh, then I'll have the factor Z to the power M1 plus M2, now, no absolute value. This is the U1 charge. And I need to uh, uh, give the expression 
for the dressing factor. So I have to divide the sum into two parts. So I'll just write it Pm of T, which is equal to the case where it is strictly bigger. M1 is strictly bigger than M2. And I'll have the whole expression. This thing goes through. And this one, when it's different than M2, the breaking needs to be one squared. So I'll have one over one minus T squared squared. And then there will be another sum, M1 equals to M2. So now the gauge loop is unbroken to rotate. So U2 remains U2, it's not U1 squared. And so now uh, it will be the same thing here and one over one minus T squared, one minus one minus T to the fourth. And that's it. This is the sum that we need to perform. Exercise. Show that the Coulomb branch is a complete intersection. So for every line, it's greater than M2, it will be C2. So to understand this, uh, you need to think about brains, right? Suppose that I have two brains with positions M1 and M2. What's the gauge group here? U1 squared. And what's the gauge group here? I think so I that's how we have that's a good so in terms of weights that's uh, that's how we check. Okay. So you guys understand that at U2, you have to compute P and T of the interval of the adjoint of SU2 times U1. That is uh, what we said is the, the, the power of T of the forward two that the Cassie means. Well, it's, it's sometimes it's a very explicit uh, formula. You have to follow. It's in some sense, in all senses. Uh, very, I guess, we can uh, make a mathematical program. I guess when you when you sum up over so when when you sum up over t to the delta, you just go up to a certain order with the values of the magnetic charge. Yeah, when, when so the order of computation is a challenge for if you want to implement it into a computer program, and you need to come up with the clever ways. They could become quite so tricky. Are there, any, are there any tricks? I mean, yeah, beyond the explicit tricks. You could have, uh, you could play with the geometry to divide into analytic regions uh, where uh, you could, uh, in each region, you could sum. Ah, so you think of MIs as some coordinates on a two dimensional letter. So there are some, some simplifications of the sum equations that you can um, 
Possibly. I mean, uh, depending on the problem. But once you have the absolute values, you could divide to all possible regions where each in each region there is an analytic behavior. In the analytic, in this analytic region, you could sum explicitly, exactly. And then you could uh, you need to add up all of the contributions. So this is something that uh, uh, Marcus uh, Schwerling did as part of his PhD project. And uh, he wrote a paper which explains the, the difficulties and also he wrote down the explicit formulas. It was later used by some group uh, of uh, Chinese students to compute uh, various differences. Uh, More questions? The background field, uh, yeah, if I turn on the background screen, then the delta is delta plus delta. Uh, is there a question? Interesting. Well, it requires a lot of computational uh, spending time on computations. So without spending time, uh, it would be difficult to follow. The background of the entity charges and my prime, yeah, that's a fixed set of integer numbers. Yes, they could be, uh, could be ordered, they could be unordered. There are many different chambers. Yeah, and they will uh, depend. Again, there will, there will be a complicated analytic, analytic behavior. If you really want to write the dependence on all charges, you need to put absolute values and divide into regions. There, there is an action of the file selection between one region and another. There are always a final number. Yeah, it's a, the, the global symmetry is a, a CUN, so the number of the chambers is And uh, in general, uh, depending on the choice of the quiver, it's just the um, chambers of the Lee algebra, the global symmetry. And the connection to all the little bit polynomials that exist uh, even without the back of magnetic charges. If if you set the magnetic charge, the background magnetic charges to zero, the only polynomial reduces to um, I think it's called a show polynomial. Yes. Or to characters, just to ordinary characters. Um, but this is in the theory of symmetric functions, you, you will uh, find uh, all of this uh, stuff. It's well known. It's, it's that it's stuff from uh, the 20s. Yeah. Yeah. Wherever uh, all a little bit uh, were active. Continue for five of them, and then this Okay. So, uh, so now I'm going to assume that uh, we all know the monopole formula and that it is possible to uh, use it to compute uh, any quiver. Right? We did it for the general gauge group, general representation, and uh, given a quiver, you just apply this formula. Uh, to the to the quiver and you compute uh, what it is and uh, I don't have much to to offer a anything I will say will be a repetition of what I already said you just need to implement the uh, the formulas that we have here on the board and it's a very explicit expression you are, you are saying everything in the computer section always huh? it always turns out to be computer section
we're dealing, we're, dealing, yeah. we're dealing with this quiver. If you give me a different quiver, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Uh, Very few are uh, okay. the interesting procedure. Okay. There's also a question in the audience whether the topological symmetry in this case. Yeah, it's uh, what we said uh, for J here, with topological symmetry. is U1, and there might be some exceptions in case uh, um, that uh, we have uh, special conditions. Let me write it here. For N equals to K, uh, this symmetry is announced to SU2. And here I should say that the N should be greater than 2K. Otherwise, the uh, expression, oh, uh, Oh, I messed up. I messed up. I forgot to uh, when we wrote the explicit expression. Remember that there are two contributions, and I only wrote one of them. So, uh, so this is the expression from the first part here, right? The weights of the fundamental representation of UK are the first, the second, and so on. We could write them in a, in a basis, uh, one, zero, zero, two, zero, one, zero, zero, one, and so on. One in one entry and zero elsewhere. And when you take the product, you get these MIs, as we wrote over here. So this is fine, but I need to uh, subtract the contribution from the uh, roots. And this will give me uh, some i less than k, m i minus m k. That's very important. Right? Because the root system of uh, UK is given by a collection of uh, Euclidean vectors, and the roots are uh, EI minus EJ. Positive is I, I less than J, negative is I greater than J, but both of them contribute in the same way, so I have this question. Regarding the topological solution, so it's just one V1 out of the entire global solution. Uh, Yes, I mean, originally for the well, one n case, it was one times of the bar. It's your it's your bar. Or no, it's just you one. Yeah, there also just you one. Just you one. You one. Yes, here also it's just you one. You one. Yes. But for more different more. Yes, and uh, it would be uh, th this is a great uh, part in uh, presentation. We have very large rivers with some nice symmetry. So the Hilbert is so far here. Can I do the monotope formula and expand it? Maximum will be the characters. If I shall write it, the character expansion. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> yeah, it won't be uh, the highest weight generating function will be not be useful in case the symmetry is small. 
if the symmetry could be at most less u2, so you could try. I don't think it would give you a nice expression. It's a rational function. It's a numerator of the common. Uh, all, all those varieties are, uh, all symplectic singularities are, uh, are, have this property of being kind in any symplectic singularity. Any symplectic similarity is going to die. Well, it's not that good. Uh, that's not. I mean, Calabria was Goldstein. No. Uh, Goldstein has singularities. Calabria manifold is smooth. So uh, I, I do make this distinction. If you tell me this, I will keep on going. Okay. So. Uh, a hyperkeller manifold has singularities, and those are symplectic singularities. Calabria manifold can admit singularities, and then they will be going to like singularities. And um, the Calabria manifold is not good. Yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, computational uh, techniques, uh, if you uh, rely on palindromic uh, property, then you need to compute up, up to a certain order. And then you will find that uh, any term after that will contribute to the hypothesis just what is predicted from uh, the expansion of the numerator. I must start to repeat the author directly. Yeah, so those are computational <laughs> techniques. Yeah. yeah, so that's one way of doing that. And then you could have, um, you could divide into analytic pieces. When you divide into analytic pieces, you could compute to all of those. So um, different approaches were attempted uh, over the years. So that there's the approach of uh, Marcus, and uh, there are some movements of that. Um, we, we can discuss each one of them in case you want to go over the technical yeah. details of the computer. Maybe with that, we can wrap up the first lecture yeah. today and we can continue in the afternoon.